I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and finance. This week, all sorts of stuff. The World Economic Forum is happening in Thailand. We're speaking to the president of Thai Airways as he heads to departures. But why has he been fired for leading a financial turnaround? Also, a global trade crisis. There are worrying new figures from the World Trade Organization pointing to a continued slowdown. And how government can get in the way of growth for everyday India. Tales of bureaucracy and corruption from the subcontinent. So it's a little hard to define exactly which direction we're taking you this week because we've got lots of different strands, lots of major business and economic players to talk to. I accept to say that the bulk of our content comes from Thailand and the World Economic Forum on East Asia. Veronica Pedroza has been there for us, speaking to business and economic minds alike about a region which still sees good growth but might have to just readjust its sights given the continued downturn that we see in the northern hemisphere. Uh, so this is our guest list for this week, the outgoing boss of Thai Airways, and this is an interesting one because of just why uh, he is outgoing. Also the head of the World Trade Organization, he was in Thailand too for the forum. Uh, and from here I'll be speaking to the World Bank's chief economist about the new balance economies need to strike in order to find true growth. But let's start with Thai Airways, and if you were the CEO of such a company and had turned around its fortunes, it wouldn't be unreasonable to expect some sort of reward, right? You certainly wouldn't expect to lose your job. And yet that is exactly what has happened to the president and CEO of Thai Airways, Piers Vasti Amranand. Look at what he managed to do. An airline that, partly due to last year's floods, made a loss of $320 million in 2011, $321 million. He's now predicting it'll hit a $191 million profit this year. But here's the catch. Thai Airways is 51% owned by the finance ministry and, as is often the case, new governments mean new management. Pia Vasti Amranan was appointed by the previous Democrat-led government. Is he simply a political casualty? Well, who better to ask than the man himself? Here's Veronica Pedroza's interview with the outgoing CEO of Thai Airways. You were president of Thai Airways for two years, seven months, during which time you're credited with having turned the fortunes of the company around. How did you do it? Um, the first thing was to, to get the management, really manage the company, because Thai Airways is a company with a long history of the board, the politicians managing the company, and with the management simply, simply following orders. It's a state enterprise, but it's also a listed company in the stock market, but it had no good governance like other, other listed companies in the stock market. So that was the first thing which I agreed with the board, that we must work together in the same way as any listed company with good governance. That is, the board is responsible for policy and the management manages the, the company. And that was crucial because it then allowed the management to really think to really make decision for the first time in years. And with that, you were, we were able to come up with strategic plan. We were able to come up with a lot of measures in order to uh, improve the efficiency of the airline in all aspects. I think fleet renewal, retrofit of the interior of all aircrafts, uh, marketing strategies, uh, financial improvement, including uh, obtaining of new funding, capital raising, as well as renegotiation of terms and conditions for all loans. Um, plus, of course, human resources and, 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 and installing good governance within the company. You're talking about massive capital expenditures. Wasn't that a bit of a gamble given the economic and political environment? Uh, not really. I think you see, the thing is, new aircrafts is an instrument we use to earn our living. So you need good aircrafts, because if you do not have good aircrafts, passengers disappear, because the competition is so fierce that you really have to have good products. Otherwise, your passengers will not fly on Thai Airways because they have other choices, not unlike um, 20 years ago when there were not many airlines. So retrofit of the old aircrafts, um, new aircrafts with very good interior are crucial. And we had seen very clearly that 
good interiors attract more passengers. So that's the first thing. The second thing is this, that new aircrafts are a lot more efficient than old aircrafts. Technologies have been changing very rapidly. Oil accounts for 40% of the cost of the airline business. Now, new aircraft is probably around 20 or 30 percent more fuel efficient than old aircraft. If our fuel efficiency is the same as Singapore Airlines, we could have saved 8,500 million baht last year. So that would mean a profit last year, not a loss. Um, and the other thing which I just want to mention is this, that apart from the, the new aircrafts and so on, which are crucial, you need to control your cost. You, you have to be efficient in all aspects uh, because the margin is so thin. So we had embarked on various measures to, to improve efficiency and cut the cost uh, because figures show that we are not all that efficient. The board of Thai terminated your contract recently. Why yes. are you fighting it? Um, well, the reason is unclear. We, we made a loss last year, yes, but that was because of the, the flood. I think the flood affected Thai Airways only. Domestic traffic was good because people couldn't travel by, by road, so they traveled by air, but, but the travel warnings issued by many countries um, reduced significantly uh, travel into Thailand, so that's why we, we made a loss. That together with the oil price um, had enormous impact on us. But then this year, I think we had been able to, to make a profit again. Passengers came back, and so far this year, we had been doing very well. Passenger traffic had gone up significantly. Our cabin factor had been 78% on average for the first four months of this year. And we had announced already a profit of 3,600 million baht uh, for the first quarter of this year, whereas Singapore Airlines, Lufthansa, and many other airlines had made losses. And, and why we are making profit this year, and despite the high oil price, that is because of the various cu cost-cutting measures, plus the management of the, the fuel cost, plus the change in the marketing strategy where more emphasis is now faced on Asia and less on Europe. And April, I cannot say what the number is, but again, April, which is the beginning of our low season, we ha had done well financially, and even in the low season, which is now uh, May, which is May and June. May and June is normally the worst month of Thai Airways, and it looks as if that May and June would be a pretty good month because so far, uh, you know, for the tw first 25 days of, 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 of May of this year, we had seen passenger traffic growing by about 17% year on year. And we are going to get the best cabin factor for May for 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 five years, and advanced booking still looks very good. But what, now, if, so, so, yeah, but so what if it's not about the bottom line? So, 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 so I'm saying that. <laughs> so I'm saying that this is what is happening. Okay, um, performance evaluation last year I got 87 percent, uh, and performance is doing very well, and that's why the board had not been able to give me uh, a reason for for terminating my contract. The contract says you can. You can terminate the contract by giving me a one month advan advance notice and pay me six months. That that standard contract in all contracts of CEO or state prices. So I'm simply asking the board to say publicly what is the reason, and they haven't said that yet. I think Thai Airways is a listed company in the stock market. It's not just a certain price, and the public has the right to know the real reason. The outgoing boss of Thai Airways there, and of course airlines are critical to global trade, keeping the flow of goods and services around the world moving, but you know the World Trade Organization is not convinced global trade is actually in good shape. Here are the numbers for you from the World Trade Organization economists who are projecting trade growth will be there, 3.7% in 2012. That is slowing down, particularly when you look at the year before. It was 5% in 2011, and that's way down on the rebound there was of 13.8% back in 2010 after the initial crisis. In terms of export-import figures, well, the European Union actually still leads the way despite the Eurozone crisis. Uh, both imports and exports are up 17% there. And then when you look at Asia, uh, imports up 23 percent 
and exports up 18%. So what has put the brakes on trade expansion though? Even though those numbers look good, you've got to think about the slowdown. Well, really, what hasn't put the brakes on it? Eurozone debt crisis, Japanese tsunami, war in Libya, they are all adverse, unpredictable developments which affect how we trade. Here's Veronica again at the World Economic Forum, this time speaking to the World Trade Organization's Director General, Pascal Lamy. Uh, you recently put together a statement with some other international leaders about the need for global and economic leadership. Can you tell us what led to that? Well, I think we in international organization uh, all observe that the level of international cooperation is too low. This crisis is a global crisis. We need governments, countries to cooperate. The more they cooperate, the shorter the exit will be. The less they cooperate, the longer the exit will be. And we are worried and we see that in the WTO, in the IMF, in other international institutions, the capacity of national leaders to engage into international cooperation and com compromises is clearly below par. And that's probably one impact of the crisis, that they have to concentrate more on their domestic issues, sidelining international issues, which unfortunately have become extremely important. You've also commented on the so-called growth versus austerity debate. Can you talk about that from the perspective of trade and trade's relationship with growth? Well, in the case of Europe, and probably later in the case of the US, you need to find the proper mix between adjusting this huge debt mountain, which obviously is unsustainable on the one side, and on the other side, keeping the economy growing. And we know there is a tension between fiscal adjustment, restricting public expenditure, which then risks to slow growth, and structural reforms, which lead to an increase in the growth potential. So this compromise, which is not something about who's right, who's wrong, both need to be done, is very difficult uh, to broke, not least because various countries are leaning on either side. You've made a very um, specific link, haven't you, between trade and growth. I is that debate over? I think everybody recognises that opening more trade is a positive contribution to growth. The problem being that in order to do that, you have to cope with inevitable uh, domestic pressures uh, in the sense of protecting vested interests. And here again, this needs political leadership, but it remains that opening trade is the low cost, zero budget device to grow your economy, which as we know, they all need in these times of crisis. You've become a kind of self-appointed defender of China. I've seen media reports where you defend China's reputation. But really, what is China's record within the WTO? Well, first, I'm neutral. I'm not defending or attacking any country, at least in public. I sometimes have to do that in uh, private. Uh, but I think overall, uh, China's record in the WTO is an extremely positive one. I mean, they joined the WTO 10 years ago. As a result of that, they opened their economy. As a result of that, Chinese imports have been uh, growing very fast for the last uh, 10 years. Now, true, Chinese exports have also been growing. So overall, it's a positive development. But then there's the issue of currency. I'm not sure it's uh, that a big issue if you look at uh, numbers. And by the way, the IMF is still uh, working uh, on whether there are new determination of the renminbi is on the side of uh, uh, underappreciation or not. Uh, I think there are issues about open trade in China as elsewhere, which are more important for the moment than uh, currency valuations. 
You've got a bit more than a year left as the Director General of the World Trade Organization. What do you intend to do with that? What kind of legacy do you want to leave? Mm. Well, I still have a, a year. 16, <laughs> 16 months ahead of me. I think for the moment, the most urgent thing is to contain, push back protectionist pressures which are uh, flaring uh, everywhere. That's the most urgent thing. In order to keep opening trade, the first thing you have to do is to keep trade open. And in this very precise circumstances, we inevitably are confronted with protectionism. And we, as you know, in the WTO, very precisely monitor this, trade restrictive measures, trade opening measures. And what we will tell the G20, and we will publish a full report next week about that, is that in recent time, this situation has become more worrying. But there seems to be a general acceptance at this point that the Doha round is now dead. Surely the issue that you're talking about makes it more urgent to come up with some other kind of multilateral trade agreement. We still have to keep pushing. And by the way, there are areas where progress has been made, like the government procurement agreement, for instance, which we have extended last year. There are serious negotiations about uh, what we call trade facilitation, which is a multilateral agreement to simplify uh, border procedures, which still account for serious obstacles for trade. And there are other areas like the information technology agreement, which is a specific agreement, which might be renegotiated in good conditions. So it's not all black, but true. The big deal, the one that was envisaged in Doha, uh, on the sort of 20 chapters of the WTO rulebook, uh, is for the moment uh, not going to unfold short term. So, Pascal Lamy didn't have the greatest trade outlook there, did he? And unfortunately, the same thing seems to apply to the wider economy. At the start of the year, the chief economist at the World Bank warned of a new downturn worse than the 2008 financial crisis. Justin Lin said developing countries in particular should be a major focus because that's where things could be turned around. He talked about a new way of economic thinking, which was where we began our conversation earlier in the week. Justin Lin, thank you so much for joining us. We do appreciate it. I'm reading your uh, recent paper, I think from April it is, about, as you call it, new structural economics, the idea of rethinking the way we look at economic development. Can you tell our viewers, in the simplest terms possible, what's wrong with our economic thinking at the moment? Since the Second World War, with the guidance of the existing economics, most developing country fail to achieve that goal. Because? Because economic theory try to explain the economic phenomenon. And uh, to base on those kind of understanding to design policy to achieve its intended goal. Okay, so and, uh, as you're, I mentioned, you're saying then, sorry to interrupt you, you're saying about redesigning the thinking. What, again, the idea of bringing the developing countries more to the fore, how do we rethink, what specifically do we rethink to change this? I think we need to have a bit, much better you know, balance between the role of the government as well as the role of the markets. Developing thinking in the past either focuses on the role of the government or the role of the market. But I think uh, to achieve the development goal, we need to have both the, gov the government and uh, the market to work together. Okay, then let me give you an example then. And it's an example of where I am here in the Middle East, where development is incredibly fast. And there almost seems to be an idea within the governments here of build it and they will come. In other words, build all these huge buildings, all this infrastructure, and the people will come, they will set up, and they will develop the economies there. Now, that is very strong government backing there, but it needs a, a free market to work as well to sustain it. Is that the way it works? Is that the way it can work, or is that just specific for this part of the world, which has a lot of money? 
Well, that's part of it. Certainly, if a country wants to develop modern industries, infrastructure is a very important part. But uh, for the private sectors to go to the new industries, new sectors, they also need to have other components, which the spontaneous market force may not be able to you know, provide the necessary condition for the private sectors. For example, if you want to go to the new sectors, you also need to have the skilled technologies. Mm. And uh, also, for the first movers, they also will face all kind of risk. And uh, the government also need to help with those kind of conditions in order to encourage the private sectors to diversify or to upgrade uh, to make investment in the new sectors. And is that where countries in Asia, for example, have been more successful? We looked a lot at uh, Thailand, <coughs> excuse me, Thailand a few weeks ago on this program and looked at how, how well it was growing um, despite the setbacks it's had recently with the floods and things like that. But there are a lot of countries in Asia which have got sustained growth and were insulated from a lot of the big economic problems. How did they get it right? And, and if you can give me some specific examples as well. I think that uh, certainly the government in all countries have attempted to you know, support this kind of dynamic growth. And about only a few of them were able to achieve their intended you know, goal. I think that uh, there are several things that we can learn in the past. In the past, either the government goal were too ambitious. Mm. They wanted to build up advanced industries, but most of them have the agrarian low-income foundations. And those kind of industries went against their competitive advantages. They are not competitive their establishment to require government protection and uh, continuous you know, subsidies. And those kind of government intervention in general failed. Justin Lin, Chief Economist at the World Bank, thank you so much for your time. Now, something Justin mentioned there was the balance needed between government influence and market influence. It's got to be the right kind of both. We've got an example now from India, a report from Pranasuri, which looks into what is hurting the economy there. And there's no two ways about it, the government is part of that. It's a busy time at the Gopsons factory. Paper printed here is shipped around the world. But Vasant Gol, the owner of this mega printing plant, is worried. He's got this message for his government. Make decisions faster, give us clarity on policy. Things like corruption and bureaucracy, I can only... Um, we can just say that remove these things and you know I mean the, these are cost hidden costs for us so help us help businesses it's a sentiment shared by other entrepreneurs India's economy has taken a beating in the last few months this year growth fell to 6.9 percent down from 8.4 percent last year tax revenues have dropped by 2.5 percent and last week the rupee slumped to an all-time low against the dollar and these numbers are making economists like Partho nervous. The big collapse that's happened in our uh, economy has not been that of consumption. It's largely been that private investment has tanked completely. And it is not as if the private investment is tanked because there's no money. We have the money, but we don't have, th these people don't have the confidence to invest. That confidence is being stemmed by what's seen as government inefficiency. Many outside say that inside India's parliament, financial reforms haven't been passed quickly enough, that the government hasn't mustered enough support among its coalition partners to pass those important bills, and that incentives for investors are few and far between. Besides all of this, there are also some other issues. Like corruption. Doing business here in most cases means paying someone a bribe, even if you're a roadside vendor like Suresh. <laughs> I have to bribe both the government and local police officials. If I don't do that, they would throw me out of here. So as India's economy continues to fluctuate, its people are hoping there are better times ahead. 
And there you have it, another week of Counting the Cost and a big contribution from Veronica Pedroza this week. So thank you to her. And if you want to contact her on Twitter, at uh, the Pedroza is the name to look for. Also, you could drop me a line if you want, at Kamal AJE, uh, or our business editor, at Abid Oliver Ali. You can go all, all, all old-fashioned on us too if you want. Uh, email countingthecost at aljazeera.net. There's also aljazeera.com slash business. And that is where you can link on to the CTC page and catch up with some of our past episodes. We're also going to put a, a little video blog up there earlier in the week, uh, which is filmed in our office. You can get an idea of what is coming up on the program that way. But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.